Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are going to get started in about a minute, just going to let folks join this web page. Um, and just a reminder that you can ask your questions and join in the conversation in the chat here on YouTube. So you're going to need a YouTube account to be able to um, chat, but you can just sign up with the Google account and then you can be part of the conversation. So we definitely encourage you to do that. Um, hi everyone, my name is Joy Yamaguchi. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the Japanese American National Museum. And thank you so much for tuning in today for um, our next installation in the Janum Digital Film Festival. Um, this is part of our Janum at Home initiative, which is what we have been working on since um, the Safer at Home orders have been in place. Um, it's really an exciting way for us to connect differently um, with a, our audience online. And um, you can find out more about that on our website, janum.org. Um, has lots of educational content, different programs, videos, and all sorts of exciting things to explore. Um, and today we are talking about Big Drum, um, Taiko in the US exhibition from 15 years ago, um, which is really exciting. So we're going to be having a really wonderful panel of folks um, joining us now. Um, and I also just wanna say a thank you, special thank you to all of our members that are watching right now and that are part of our audience. Um, your support is really what lets us keep doing programs like this one. And if you aren't a member yet, we encourage you to check out um, our website as well and learn more about that wonderful opportunity to get involved with Janum. Um, and with that, I'm gonna introduce our panelists starting with Kei Fukumoto who is a 50-year performer of Fukushima Ondo and founded Maui Taiko to continue the century's old tradition. She has taught the Sugar Plantation era song to over 10 groups in North America and has returned back to Japan to share the song in towns throughout the Fukushima prefecture. We'll also be joined by Teddy Yoshikami, who was born in American concentration camp of Tule Lake and then moved to Amachi in Colorado. She grew up in Seabrook, New Jersey and has lived in New York City since 1965. She's worked in dream research, formed her own modern dance company for over 10 years um, and managed programs for the first Asian American nonprofit organization, Basement Workshop. She's lived in Japan and worked at the American Museum of Natural History for over 18 years before retiring. And she has played Taiko with So Daiko for over 25 years and now teaches Taiko to all ages. Um, we're also really excited to welcome Taiko artist Kenny Endo, who became, began in 1975 with Kinara Taiko and San Francisco Taiko Dojo. Um, Kenny later spent 10 years in Japan working with Osua Daiko and O Erosuke Roku Taiko. He received his Natori in Hogaku Hayashi from the Mochizuki School and studied Edo Bayashi in the Wakayama style. And he is a performer, composer, and instructor based in Honolulu, where he is the artistic director of the Taiko Center of the Pacific. He regularly performs original music with his ensemble, as well as has collaborations with artists from around the world. And then our last Taiko player, featured player from the um, films that are here on YouTube, so definitely check those out, is PJ Hirabayashi, who has been playing Taiko for 47 years. As a founding member of San Jose Taiko, um, having transitioned out of leadership in 2011, she continues her current Taiko work with Taiko Peace. And Peace is the acronym for Partnerships in Empathy and Creative Empowerment. Um, so I wanna welcome all of them, as well as Sojin Kim, the curator of the, um, at the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, as well as the curator of the Big John exhibition at Janum. And then finally, our last panelist is Akira Bach, who's the director of the Watase Media Arts Department at Janum and was the director of these Big Drum films that we're sharing today. Um, and I want to let you all know, welcome you, thank you for coming, and also let you know that we have a very active chat today. So lots of people saying hello and really excited um, for this conversation today. So thank you so much to everyone for being a part of this. Um, I know I gave a brief introduction, but I would love to invite you all to kind of share more about your own histories with Tycho, your own relationships with it. This is a um, retrospective conversation 15 years later. Um, so I'd love if you could kind of ground us in your own personal histories and connections. Um, if anyone wants to start. <laughs> Should I call on someone? <laughs> Kay, did you want to start with there? <laughs> so you can unmute yourself. Oh, there you go. You're good. Great. <laughs> Aloha, everyone from Maui, Hawaii. I'm 
uh, my involvement in Taiko started, you know, through the Obon traditions. And um, a, a song from Fukushima Prefecture came to Hawaii with the sugar plantation workers. And so within my family, we've continued the tradition of performing that particular piece at Obon uh, festivals here on Maui uh, for over a century. Um, so I'm the third generation person who has tried to continue to perpetuate the song. Um, you know, because my focus had, had been Obon Taiko, um, you know, getting involved in Kumi Daiko and learning from these fabulous sensei like, like Kenny Endo and, you know, um, the late uh, Fame Komagata and PJ and Roy, um, it's just been fabulous that the evolution of Taiko over the years um, has really been unique. I, I, you know, I truly believe it, it for Hawaii, it came through um, the Obon tradition, um, but obviously the artistic form really changed over time. So it's been fabulous that um, the Big Drum collaboration really shared the, the perspective of where Taiko had, had come. Does anyone wanna go next? PJ, <laughs> do you wanna share? <laughs> Sure. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, really great to be here. Cannot believe it's been 15 years <laughs> since the big drum exhibit. And um, uh, I just will go, yeah, go back to how I saw Taiko first. And that was seeing uh, San Francisco Taiko Dojo uh, perform in San Francisco at a community festival. What I was deeply moved by other, I mean, besides seeing the taiko being played, but uh, what I loved about it was to see the integration of men and women together. And um, I always tell the story that I was so deeply inspired by a mother and daughter playing on the stage together. And then uh, for me, um, taiko started here in San Jose, Japantown. Um, and uh, started at the Buddhist temple. It was uh, to be an activity for the youth, uh, very much uh, copying um, Kinata Taiko in Los Angeles. Um, however, the youth kind of stepped away as the community also embraced uh, people from the college at San Jose State. Um, and this is how the, the Taiko group became more of a community group back in 1974, 73. Um, my involvement has been uh, all through the very beginning trying to figure out how do I play? <laughs> how do I teach? <laughs> how do I um, uh, explain what Taiko is? Uh, how do I get money? <laughs> um, so going to, to, through the whole nonprofit and uh, really feeling the um, need to um, bring the Japanese American story into Taiko was kind of my uh, personal interest from the very beginning. Thank you. Teddy, you're um, muted. I can unmute you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. So um, I guess, I mean, I'd seen Tycho from Seabrook where they would be playing in, in but it was very rare. And then also when I came up to New York, the, the, um, they were playing, mostly the people in the community people were playing uh, for Obon, and there was the Yagura, and I think, there, but the person who's playing, I guess he was, he was a little, a little tipsy all the time. <laughs> so eventually, I think they were able to remove him and put some other people to play. So there were a couple other members who were really into Taiko, and they wanted to start a Taiko group. Uh, but um, we hadn't really, you know, we didn't know anything. So I think we learned from, um, People like PJ look, looking around what they're doing, and I think Alan and Merle Kata, who were in the group, who were their first original members, they um, went. I think were excited because of, of the Chicago Taiko group there, 
and they were really enthusiastic and wanted to start something. So then they started pulling people in uh, to come and play and we go, what? You want what? <laughs> you want what to do? So we had no idea what they meant really. Um, but we, they just wanted to start this title group. So come and just see, I said, well, okay, I'll come by and take a look. You know, at the same time I was, I had a, um, I came out of a real professional dance theater kind of background. So uh, what is this community group? I can't imagine them doing anything, you know? <laughs> but uh, I was curious, so I went. And, um, and so I, I was thinking I could really incorporate dance movements as well into the title, but it's not as easy as, as, as really um, to do. And I know when I tried to do some Later on, years later, I tried to do some, and then I was given like five minutes to work on the movement with Taiko. I said, you can't do it that way. There's no way. So it was almost an impossible task. Uh, so I just, I had, if some of the members, when I had, I did a performance in the night, they had them dragging the drums on, the small Taiko onto the floor and putting it onto stands. And, and then, uh, uh, they they kind of would crawl on the floor because <laughs> nobody would dance. Nobody felt they comfortable to do it. Well, what can I do with them? So I had to make them kind of do these lower, you know, really simple things, walk <laughs> or crawl. <laughs> so so all do the crawling taiko, like you know, like Tanaka always told us, you know, we're crawling babies, right? So um, yeah, and then what was Earlier before that, though, we had Tanaka who come out and done some workshops with us, too. And, of course, then he was very strict. Everybody was so scared of him because, uh, um, you know, he, he would he had one of our members just play the old Aiko and he said, oh, I'm going out for a cigarette. And he'd go off and wander around and we were wondering, when is he going to come back? And the poor person on the old Aiko was he was so in the groove of playing that when we told him to stop, stop already, you don't have to play because Tanaka's back and he couldn't even hear us. He was just playing so much. He just was going on and on and on. He must've been playing for, I don't know, 20 minutes. Just old Daiko, don, 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 don. So, so it was really hard, <laughs> but he finally, we got him off. <laughs> but so, I don't know. It's always been an exciting way of really learning and being friends and meeting so many people through Taiko. I think that's what's been really the excitement of, of just meeting everyone, you know, just not in our own group, but then for uh, for every all the groups we met, especially when we came out to the conference, early conferences. Um, and I know when I ever meet uh, Tanaka Sensei, he's always he always looks at me because we're we're like the same age, and so he's oh. You still playing, Teddy? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <He's> like, oh, <laughs> I kept thinking, oh, he thinks I should stop playing. <laughs> but year after year, whenever I see him at the conferences, he, every time he would say, he would ask me the same question. <laughs> so anyway, but it's it's really been an exciting uh, adventure just playing taiko, and I'm glad now. I I really, you know started teaching Taiko. So it's been great. So from youngsters all the way to adults. That's so great. Um, we have a couple of comments saying that they're still trying to learn how to cartwheel like you. So <laughs> <laughs> um, Kenny, did you want to speak to this? Sure. Um, yeah, I think uh, the fact that Teddy was a dancer really helps and having a uh, people like that, not, not only people that with a musical background, but people who had a movement background, whether it was dance or martial arts or sports, uh, really um, added something to Taiko. Uh, for myself, um, I saw the San Francisco Taiko Dojo for the first time in 1973, uh, when I was a student at UC Santa Cruz, and they were performing uh, in San Jose, actually, uh, at an event called Bamboogie. And um, that's when I read, met um, PJ and Roy and all the San Jose folks. Um, but when I saw that that uh, performance of the ta Taiko Dojo, it was just it just totally blew me away. You, you could you could feel the drums down to your bones. And, I, and I, as soon as I saw that, I said, I, I got to do that. I mean, I had been playing drums since I was a, a kid, Western drums. Um, 
and then uh, later um, in 1974, I saw Kinara perform, and I talked to uh, Johnny and Reverend Moss after the performance and said I was interested. And uh, the following year, to my surprise, they called me because all the other members were Senshin, um, were members of Senshin Buddhist Temple. Um, so that's how I kind of got involved in it. And then, and then um, seeing Hiroshima play with Japanese instruments, June playing koto and, and Johnny playing taiko. There was one great performance uh, called Monkey, um, where um, Johnny Mori, uh, Clark Nakashita, Mei Sugano from Kinara Taiko performed. It just totally blew me away. And uh, so I started playing in 1975, um, both with Kinara and then at that time they were only playing during the Obon season. So they referred me to Tanaka Sensei and, and I started studying with him. Eventually I wanted to um, learn more traditional music. So I moved to Japan in 1980, originally intending to stay for about a year. Um, and then uh, it ended up being 10 years. And the more I studied, the more I realized how little I knew. So, um, I mean, I'm still trying to learn uh, at, to this day, but um, there's, there's just so much, but, um, this uh, big drum, um, this big drum exhibit was really a great thing. It happened at the same time as at one of our North American Taiko conferences um, in uh, LAJ town. So it was a really great event, and the amount of work that um, all the, you know, Akira and his his crew and Sojin uh, put into this was really amazing, and uh, it's it's. Uh, surprising to see that it's already been 15 years. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that everyone who we've been saying it's a 15 year anniversary, they're like, how has it been so many years? But um, I have a question that was submitted specifically to Sojin and then I think also to Sojin and Akira. Um, but if you want to talk a little bit about why you decided to do this exhibit, like what inspired you to produce this, um, the both the exhibition as well as this documentary um, and these series of films. Um, and then the follow-up question to that is if you could make a sequel or do one today, um, Deborah Wong said, call, call it Big Drum 2, Louder and Faster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what would you want to showcase and why? Um, well, you know, I would start by saying that um, the idea for the exhibition really came from Karen Higa, who was the director of curatorial at Janum, who was the sister of Kevin Higa, who was the coordinator of the first North American Taiko Conference and who was a really talented, I mean, probably still is, <laughs> very talented multi-instrumentalist percussionist um, who played with Kinata Taiko, was really supportive of collegiate Taiko, started a newsletter to begin to connect the groups and regions of the country together um, to share information about Taiko. And, and Karen, seeing the work that Kevin did, um, began to imagine that this would be a really fantastic topic for an exhibition. So she was the per person who actually pitched it. I remember I was actually finishing up another exhibit or, or getting ready for it to open another exhibit. And she said, okay, you know, when you're done with this, I wanna talk, what would you think if we did an exhibition? It could be about Tycho. And she went through all of the things that she thought were so important and dynamic about it. And she said, I even know what the title is. The title is Big Drum, Tycho in the US. So it's really Karen and Kevin who um, really put their minds together and, and suggested this idea. Um, we always thought of it, um, and this is why Akira is such an important part of the project is we always thought of it not just as an exhibition project, but that it would be an oral history project. Um, that the objective was we were going to document the, the, the history and the particularly um, US roots and expression of Taiko. Um, and then we, this is like the early 2000s, right? So we're thinking let's, this is about a snapshot, getting a snapshot of Taiko in the early 2000s. Um, this is when the, the first, the pioneering Taiko groups in the US are starting to near their 25th anniversary. It's when Taiko is really expanding. There's more um, energy and momentum around the conferences. Taiko is being taken up in more and more regions that aren't, that don't have historical um, Japanese American or Asian American communities. And so as Taiko is changing, which is normal, right, with any tradition or art form, the idea was let's think about how to document and collect reflections from people who were really um, foundational in shaping Taiko in the US. Let's get their thoughts about what Taiko meant to them, what it meant to their communities, so that we, ha we have this record, this snapshot as Taiko continues to move forward in the future and change a lot. 
So um, that was the idea behind it. And then I think there's sort of these other intersecting um, significances to Taiko as just a phenomena, right? And one is that it's, it's a cultural art form that was pioneered by Japanese Americans that became popular and spread into all sorts of other communities through the work of, of Asian Americans. It wasn't something that was appropriated from Asian Americans. Asian Americans really built it, developed it, shared it, spread it. Um, and then we also thought of, in thinking about Japanese American history, we also saw Taiko as an expression of um, Japanese American resettlement, post-World War II resettlement. And it being a really, it really telling the story about how post-World War II and the decades after World War II, as people were rebuilding community, the production and the development of, of cultural expression and community making at a time when um, many people were silent or felt ashamed of Japanese heritage and culture. Then in the 1960s with civil rights and ethnic consciousness, you have people thinking about how to revitalize, how to reinterpret, how to find pride and a source of identity in, in Japanese heritage. And so we, we also were thinking about how to bring out that story as well as we went and talked to people in different regions. Akira, what do you remember about when we, when we embarked on this and what we were thinking and what we were wanting to do? Well, <clears throat> I, I have to admit, I was really just a passenger on <laughs> on Sojin's trip. Um, she she loaded, loaded us all in a big van and we just went across the country and we were lucky enough to also go across to Hawaii and document all of these amazing groups. Um, and Sojin uh, used the word snapshot and I, I feel like that's a really great word to describe um, what we were able to capture at that particular moment. And I remember Masaki Miyagawa, who was one of um, our main collaborators, along with Ann, Ann Kaneko, um, we all basically directed this, this project together. Um, but he said at the time that if anybody is interested in what happened in Taiko in 2004, we have all the material <laughs> that they can look at. Because we have just a ton of material that never made it into any of the pieces, right? Just because, you know, we're, we're limited by time. And we're also thinking about the way in which, um, you know, um, visitors to the, to the museum would experience the exhibition. And, you know, there are certain limitations on how long a person will actually stand there and watch something. Um, but, you know, I was just thinking earlier today because I, I rewatched all the pieces that we're we're actually very fortunate that we we shot all this video because now that is what exists for for people to you know to be able to look back on because I mean, the the exhibition isn't here anymore but they can they can watch these videos and you know which I think do a pretty decent job of, of capturing the the early history and um, showing off what what was going on at that particular time in 2004, 2005. I just wanted to say, add to that, um, that there is a ton of B-roll. There's fantastic stuff, so it will be great. I mean, I hope researchers and students and Taiko players will come and, you know, go through all that once it's put in a accessible format. <laughs> organized but there but there is so much I mean I think about like Kay and the Paia Obon and all the people we interviewed out in Maui and also in Oahu I mean there's there's so much more of that 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 never made it into the videos um so yes th there is a there's a lot of it I, I wanted to address Joy the other question you asked like what will we do now like what would what would the re reboot or the next part be I mean I, I would say that there are so many more people who are more directly involved in in Taiko now who are better position to sort of say where it's going and what it's doing. But one of the things I think that we couldn't do that I think could be done now is there's so many regions and there's so many different colors and shapes of Taiko all around the country. And we, we, we ended up prioritizing some of the earlier groups and kind of pivotal hubs of, of how, of where Taiko spread from. But I would say that one thing would be, um, you know, more regional coverage and actually thinking more about the fact that 
everyone now has the means to produce and record and document themselves. And so I could imagine like a project that involves the self-documentation and interpret, like a true collaboration from all the different regions. I think about how hard it was and what a mighty effort it was. That, you know, the early groups shared this information and knowledge about how to make a drum, um, their repertoire, and it was all through themselves getting in a car or onto a plane and getting somewhere to tell someone face to face about it or to put something into the mail and mail it to them. But now like information, people can go to YouTube and watch workshops. They can do workshops online, um, live. There's just so many other ways. And, and you go online and you can find a million videos of people around the country. So I, I imagine like, a, like that would be a really interesting endeavor. And I also just want to add to that. <laughs> Because the other thing that I realized while re-watching our, our docs was that there were a lot of really young players, like kids who were between you know, seven and 12 years old, who were just incredible, right, at that time. Now I want, <laughs> I want to see what they're doing now, right? I, I just hope that, that many of them kept up with, with playing Taiko and are still playing today. Yeah, I can jump in actually and just use um, uh, Kay's uh, example of Mitchell, her son, uh, that is actually in the documentary and going to Stanford and there was no collegiate taiko way before, but it, it had started to get popular uh, around 2001 or so. And then he was, and now he's with San Jose Taiko. <laughs> uh. I remember Gabe Ishida from Kenny's group saying essentially that he's like, look, you know, I started playing Taiko when I was maybe late teens or early twenties. And he was, you know, quite a fine player at that point, but he's like, I'm looking at these kids who are going to have like 10, 15 years head start on what I did. Like, what are they going to be doing in the future? So yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. And I think that one of the things we wanted to talk about was that this is, so since we're looking back, um, one, what would you all, being folks who are so fundamentally involved with the Taiko scene, like what would you want to see highlighted now? But also, yeah, looking back 15 years, has the landscape of Taiko in the U.S. changed in the way that you expected? Um, like uh, someone um, submitted a question saying that Kristen Palka stated in the documentary that she believes the next step is about to happen where Taiko becomes a really, truly world encompassing art. Um, so like, is do, do, that something that you've seen? Like, what, what are you seeing? What is your reflection over the last 15 years in the, into the future? It's a big question. <laughs> I, I'd like to address, um, you know, when I got involved in Taiko, I was 10 years old um, and, and the group, because it was a Bon Odori, you know, Taiko group, the group was all male dominated, you know, older men, and I was the only child actually that was allowed to play. Um, and I was a girl, right? And, and thinking back, I, I think about the fact that I think because I was a girl and 10 years old, they thought I was cute. And so they allowed me to be part of that. You know, mm -hmm. if I had been perhaps older, uh, it, it was strictly a male dominated um, landscape and, and things have changed so much now. Uh, with Maui Taiko, you know, our, our group is about families and they're be participating in Taiko together. And so one of the questions I think might've been, you know, that there's this, this explosion of women that are more involved in Taiko. And that is definitely true for Maui Taiko because a lot of women make the decision about what their child does as an activity. And so they do the activity with their child and then they, their child ends up going off to college and the, the mothers are still behind, you know, and still involved in Taiko. Um, so the landscape to me of Taiko has changed where I, I've seen, you know, more female involvement um, uh, from even the traditional side of Bon Taiko. Yeah, I would say that even um, in Japan, the majority of Taiko practitioners are women and um, outside of Japan, I would say it's more like 60% or more that, that are women playing. Um, but I, the, another interesting thing is the internationalization of Taiko. 
Um, there are groups, there are over 100 groups in Europe. Um, Chisiko and I went there last summer and gave workshops. And it's just incredible, the enthusiasm and sincerity and the, the energy uh, uh, over there. Um, I've been to Central America and South America to do workshops. There's a huge interest. In, there's like 100 taiko groups in Brazil. Um, I've been to Australia, and so there, it's just it's it's just exciting to see a lot of it being open to a lot of people. Um, where it started, it may have started in our communities, but just to see that um, uh, many people have access to it, uh, I think it's a really great thing, and I think the art will evolve um, in its different ways um, by people of different cultures interpreting this instrument. I have to say that, um, yeah, the, the, the growth of Taiko beyond North America and in Hawaii, um, it, it, I have to say that one of our trainees um, back in the uh, mid, late 19, about 1997 or so, uh, when he, he went back to uh, England, he was just so taken by Taiko spirit. He wanted to share that and um, got very excited to want to sh share it with young kids in elementary schools. And um, consequently, that's how things started to grow. And then um, more community people and adults started to get involved. And then um, Roy and I were invited to witness what was growing in England. And I have to say that when we were invited to go to a elementary school to see these parochial students playing taiko on um, very makeshift uh, drums that were made out of um, PVC pipes and, and um, tarpaulin heads and uh, counting in Japanese, brown hair, blue eyes, <laughs> and going, I is this taiko? So it was very interesting to see uh, something else happening outside of our skin, you know, and um, back in, in uh, when Big Drum, uh, there wasn't really that movement happening in Europe all that much. So like it's really grown, exploded since then. Hi, yeah, I think uh, Taiko's really definitely it's going to spread even further and grow further. Um, but I just from seeing this, I'm with the classes I'm teaching now, they're not, um, I'm, I was surprised that half my students are not, they're not Asian. Uh, there's some Japanese, a few Japanese, but a lot of them are, you know, from different backgrounds. It's very mixed. So I was really surprised and they just said, well, we, we saw so I go play and we wanted to see, they, they got so excited about it and they just wanted to play, you know? And, Cause I'm not teaching people who really want to do this as a profession or really learn and go into Sodaiko, which with all the discipline and all the hard work that they have to do, but they just wanted to get a feel for what it was like. So I thought there was, there was a lack of people like that, like, that's why I started teaching people who really didn't necessarily want to perform, but they really love taiko. And so that they would get a feel for what it's like to play. Uh, I don't know. And some of them, you know, I think they'll come back in several years and just stay, stay with me and play. So, uh, you know, I keep telling them, no, oh, you want to do more? Maybe you could try with so daiko now you got, you have more behind you and maybe you could do more, you know? So I, I don't know. I, I just think it attracts so many people. I mean, the, the whole sound of the drum, it just hits so many people. Is uh, I, I forget who said it. Maybe it was PJ who said, it really hits you, goes through you, right? It's true. And so, so many people uh, have that feeling when they hear it. It's so visceral. Yeah, I haven't traveled enough to know what's going on the rest of the world. You know, I'm not like Kenny where I'm traveling the world. <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> I think we're all envious of that list of places <laughs> getting to visit. Um, but actually, I guess kind of 
jumping off from that question, um, we did get one submitted um, asking about, we got two that were kind of about how North American taiko is influenced by other music and rhythms. Um, specifically, someone was asking about how much it um, is influenced by black music, um, like jazz, rock, funk, hip hop, kind of that to name a few. Um, and specifically with African-American music, many of which have roots in resistance and liberation, this um, person was wondering if the panelists could share their thoughts on the usage of these music traditions and their impact on taiko either in their own works or what they've witnessed and heard. And moving from that, thinking about the connection between the Asian American movement of the 70s, which was mentioned in the um, film, uh, and many taiko pioneers and groups histories and how the movement was influenced by black liberation movements. Um, and just wondering what these musical ties say about these Afro-Asian solidarities and if there's an intention in using these traditions. So a long question, but wondering if you all have reflections on that. I can't answer the entire questions, <laughs> uh, but I can say that um, coming out of uh, San Jose and what we were specifically uh, focused toward, we realized that um, we wanted to create our own music. Uh, and so back in the uh, early 70s, when we started 1973, 74, 75, 76, around that time, we had some really very talented musicians that actually played in bands and um, played a lot of, um, I would say, uh, 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 rock and roll, soul, R&B. And um, that really influenced our, our material. Um, there wasn't so much, um, we didn't have that much information to go by other than listening to LPs or to watch San Francisco Taiko Dojo, you know, and uh, we kept on saying, are we bastardizing the art? Well, we're having a great time, you know, making music. <laughs> so I have to say that the beginning of San Jose Taiko repertoire was really based on R&B, jazz, um, and it was not thinking so much at that time as African-American or the black experience. I mean, this is what we were, we grew up with listening to, dancing to, um, even in our movement work at that time to relax. There were a lot of Asian bands out there that were playing a lot of cover music. And we were dancing to that like in the seventies. Um, can I, I, as a drummer, I was uh, influenced by African American music to a great deal, um, especially I was into funk and I was into um, jazz and um, artists like uh, Gil Scott Heron and um, Rasan Roland Kirk, um, who literally in their performances would, um, you know, talk about some of these issues of uh, affecting uh, minorities at the time uh, in the civil rights movement. But I, I, it, there was also musicians like John Coltrane and Miles Davis, who uh, to me, um, when you hear their music, um, not only are you proud to hear that music um, if you're from the African-American community, but just as an American, as a human being, it's just such beautiful music. And uh, for myself, uh, like PJ said, a lot of a lot of the bands we we were outside of Hiroshima, we were just playing like cover tunes of of uh, soul groups or funk groups, and I thought, well, there's this Asian American movement happening. I said, well, wh where's the Asian in the Asian American? I mean, we have Asian faces, but we're trying to play all these uh, cover tunes, just like the just like the groups did. Um, so for myself, anyway, it, it, it meant going back to Japan and really studying um, what, what, what is that Asian component that, that I felt was missing in the music. So I've, I've composed pieces that bring, uh, I have this piece called Spirit of Rice, which has uh, festival music influences as well as funk music as far as the feel and improvisation as well. So um, I... As as steeply as I got into Japanese music, I'm as growing up in this country, uh, just as a musical influence, it, I couldn't be, it, it could you can't help but be influenced by uh, what we grew up with. And, and for me, it was a lot of uh, jazz and funk and Latin music. 
Yeah, I'd have to agree with Kenny. Um, for Maui Taiko, you know, because our our environment was always being at Obon dances and um, uh, having a large Japanese community around us that, um, you know, not really under realizing that whenever we were composing things that we had a more, I, I think our music was more slanted towards the, the Japanese rhythms. Um, and I didn't realize that until we actually performed um, in Taiko 10 at one of the North American Taiko conferences. And there were several Hawaii groups that were performing um, that year. And it was Reverend Moss who made the comment that, you know, he could close his eyes and he could listen to various groups and he would, re he would know which ones came from Hawaii because they, they almost had this um, uh, Japanese rhythmic, I guess, connection. And so it was, it was interesting. And that was my first um, realization that, you know, obviously whatever music we are, we are growing up with or have in our environment is what really slants, you know, how you compose music. Um, and, and here in Hawaii, you know, we don't, the, the black, uh, population is very is very you know a, a very um, small minority in, in comparison to the the Japanese the Filipino the the, the Chinese Korean so um, we weren't um, necessarily I think exposed to um, as much of the the jazz hip hop kind of music um, growing up. Yeah, one of the questions was about kind of just talking about if anyone wants to expand even more on like the influences or like what musical elements that you really brought in, especially since um, like especially a lot of really contemporary taiko compositions are seen as this like amalgamation of various genres. So, yeah, don't know if anyone wants to expand on that as well. Um. I also want to remind folks um, in the chat on YouTube that if you have any questions for this incredible panel, please leave them in the chat and I will um, share them. But we have some folks sharing some resources, um, um, how some jazz artists um, and bebop jazz artists that traveled to Japan throughout their careers like Miles Davis and um, Daihachi Oguchi, generally accepted as the founder of Kumi Daiko, was a Japanese jazz drummer in the 50s. So. Um, have a very engaged <laughs> audience as well today. Um. Yeah, I don't think with us, we had that much of an influence. Uh, I mean, growing during that earlier period, there wasn't that much mixture going on uh, with other cultures. I think it was important to actually learn more about our own culture because uh, here we're surrounded by so many different groups in New York, but then, you know, so what's the Japanese culture? What's our culture? What's, what's being Asian American? So I think we were looking, so we thought we started really late because uh, San Jose had started, Kenny was playing, um, you know, uh, Tanaka was out there. And um, so we felt we had to catch up. We had to learn from all these of uh, the first groups because we, we didn't really know, you know? So we really uh, struggled to learn the Japanese part of it. And I guess uh, similarly with, as Kenny said, uh, he went to Japan, he stayed a long time. He was the end, but uh, I was fortunate enough to get a, a fellowship to stay in Japan for nine months. So because of my dance background on the Taiko together, I was able to get this grant to live there for nine months. So I started to study the Japanese, kind of what's called the Minzoku Geno Buyo, which is a classical form. Uh, and I studied there. I was going to classes like two and three times a week. Um, I, and, and I studied with uh, one of Kenny's friends. Uh, so that was important for me to really begin to learn. So that's when I also learned Sansa, Kurakao Sansa dance where you wear the, wear the drum and then, and you dance with it. Uh, Cause I said, oh, nobody's doing that. And so that sort of combined everything that I liked really specially. So that's sort of, I think where my background is in terms of other influences. It was really trying to retain that. Uh, and just growing up in Seabrook, which I then when I was there is I'm surrounded by Japanese. So 
but then I left. And so then in New York, there wasn't, a, there's no real strong Japanese community. You know, later on, it came on when there were people like uh, coming in from uh, the new Japanese that are coming in after that. So that, that was a whole different group of people and not many re really learned new Taiko at that time. So it's really the, I think the period you start coming in. So the early period, we really didn't have much of, of an influence except to tr try to learn our own Japanese culture. I was just remembering a story related to this, well, related to Sodaiko, but also related to this, the way that different groups and different musicians brought different influences to Taiko. And I and um, Russell Baba, who started playing with um, San Francisco Taiko Dojo, and then later he and Jeannie Mercer, um, have, they've been doing Shasta Taiko right up in Northern California. But I remember Alan Okada, maybe, or maybe it was you, Teddy, describing, you know, the different people who came out to help train and teach Soldaiko. But at one point, Russell came out and had you guys playing in the dark, dark. And while he walked around playing his sax, because he was a jazz musician also, he's a saxophone player. Right, right, and then right. he walked around you guys playing the saxophone while you were playing. Exactly. <laughs> We said, what's he doing? <laughs> I don't know what we got from there, that actually. <laughs> uh, we had a specific question um, of how did the music of Miles and Coltrane influence Kenny Endo playing, if you want to take that one. Um, I think um, uh, the one of the, the features of jazz is the, the use of improvisation. And uh, in my, we have, we kind of have two separate repertoires uh, in my group, more of a traditional kumidaiko or taiko repertoire and uh, my contemporary pieces. And a lot of my contemporary pieces are, are similar to a jazz structure in that we'll have a melody and then an improvised section and a melody. It's much more simple because there's no, no chord structure, just a melody and a, and a rhythm to go along with it. But I think the, that that element of, of improvisation um, uh, um, just listening to um, John Coltrane and the, the solos that he would a, was able to come up with is just it's just amazing. Like hearing the saxophone for the first time every time you hear him, uh, and what Miles Davis did um, not only as a trumpet player but his innovations in the music, in terms of how he was constantly evolving. Uh, every every year he had different personnel, different group, and he was just changing with the times. And he was always one step ahead. And so um, th that was a huge influence for me. Um, and, and, and then even people who were literally on stage uh, talking about, you know, the African-American experience in, in their show, like Gil Scott Heron and, and Rasan Roland Kirk, um, really, really, um, really an inspiration for me to be able to create music at that higher level but at the same time not it's not just for entertainment there was a definite message to it and they're definitely part of the civil rights movement that was going on so um it was very for me uh, very engaging educational inspire in, inspiring i'd like to add that um it's so interesting to see all of our diverse histories here. Um, I, we are tremendously thankful to, to Kenny to be our ambassador to, to Japan and to North American Taiko back in the day. He supplied us with all kinds of resources. And um, yeah, that's how we were in connection with, oh, the Japan link, you know. And that's how I realized that. I'll never be Japanese from Japan playing taiko <laughs> or a Japanese playing, uh, well, you know. Um, <laughs> so finding the identity part was um, very instrumental for how I engaged in taiko. So activism for, for me actually came from Chris Ijima and Joanne Miyamoto. And so this is like in the early seventies and um, so I don't have a real solid musical background where composition is my strength, but I have to say that movement and just energy uh, that I feel that translates directly to the drum. Drum is my way of playing taiko. 
And that's what I witnessed with Chris and Joanne back in the 70s with the music that they composed, because that was our story. They were singing our songs, and I was so used to being a very angry protester, but to see that um, social justice could be so powerful in art and music. Um, and I remember uh, actually dancing at the end of one of their songs, and it was uh, Tonkobushi. It wasn't the regular Tonkobushi, it was called Tonkobushi Rock. And there's uh, Chris just jamming on his guitar and people just rising to their feet and dancing in a circle and creating not the regular Tonkobushi, but they were rocking. So you have a little bit of soul in there too. But that's what got imprinted in my DNA, my body, um, the muscle memory. And that's even before Tycho. So when I heard Tycho for the first time, I said, oh my God, that sparked the same place <laughs> of where Chris and Joanne. And um, th I think it's because of that activism and this music is our music. And then also looking for something that was our identity. Um, that's what uh, made me <laughs> be very focused that I think I'll keep on playing Tycho for a while. You actually did have a question kind of in that vein about the history of activism within Tycho and thinking about uh, there's if there's groups today who want to dedicate their spaces to playing solely um, and being a more, this person used the word apolitical space where politics should be left at the door. Um, but I was wondering kind of how you all approach it. Do you see it as that apolitical space or do you see it as an activist platform? Um, and how do we remain critically engaged with our identities and navigate our spaces of performance and practice? Or this person posits like, is that binary thinking actually not helpful? And do you all think about it in a different way? I think for Maui Taiko, um, we, we have to be very careful about um, activism. I, and, and it is because we are a nonprofit and it's a, you know, we're with the IRS, you know, a legal non nonprofit and that we cannot be involved in, in political uh, ventures, I guess. Um, but our activism has been related to peace events. You know, I, I took the group back to um, Japan and, in Hiroshima, and specifically to the Hiroshima Peace Park in 2001. And after that visit to the Peace Park, the entire group was committed to wanting to share the message of peace, you know, and, and so there were many concerts that we were involved in and many types of um, events that were always, you know, whenever we had the, um, the annual Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, memorials, we would, we would be, always be involved. Um, so that's been the role that Maui Taiko has played, um, you know, just because of experiences that we've had um, at Hiroshima. Uh, when we perform for um, political events or our demonstrations, I always tell people that it's um, their choice and that um, I don't require it, um, but, um, and that, um, but if you want to, you're, you're, you're definitely welcome to join. Um, so, so it's not something we do as a group policy, but I think individuals um, work, work uh, for the most part, everyone kind of is uh, thinks the same way. So, a lot of the events that we will perform at um, for for worthy causes, um, many of our group members will participate. But it's not mandatory or anything we do uh, as a group. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with Ken Kenny. Pretty much, uh, we would we would support a lot of. Um, activities in, in the community that we thought we should be a part of or submit so we would maybe kind of those who are wanting to do it would go and perform uh, and, and be part of that uh, but I think this year too with all the immigration issues uh, several of the, our members of the, the group now go out and, and try to do performances and so I think 
they're being more a little bit more active, but they don't necessarily say, you know, push out the whole name of Sodaiko or something, you know, but it's individuals. Uh, although I think the name does get out there anyway, but uh, it seems to be a little bit more acceptable. Acceptable, I think it was hard because we were part, we are based at the New York Buddhist Church. So we had to be careful that we don't jeopardize their, their position either. So we're always aware of that, how, how we presented ourselves. Someone had a specific question about the reimagining Taiko workshops actually um, directed at you, PJ. <laughs> uh, uh, what's so the, re the reimagining Taiko workshops involved that you're involved with that oh. had 200 plus Taiko players eager to talk about Taiko race and political action. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I had one group uh, that I worked with, Iris um, uh, Shiraishi uh, from Minnesota, and I actually jointly uh, did a class on Taiko peace, and um, it was addressing basically everything that's going on right now, but uh, how we handled our four weeks every Sunday for four weeks um, was actually to um, go inside a lot and see exactly what, what, is, what is it that we're holding inside that, uh, that informs the way we act, the way we think, um, and how, how can we uh, be a part of uh, raising our consciousness to what's happening out, out, in, out in, in our communities. And um, I have to say that we had like 12 people in, in our particular group and they were so engaged. We had like three people from Europe as well and uh, everybody all, all over from the US. And it was a, uh, great interaction of diverse experiences, diverse questions. Everybody's asking, what do I do? What am I supposed to do, you know? And it's like, let, let's find that space. Let's create the, the, the space to talk. Let's create some kind of models for interaction. Um, it, it was a, a great exchange. Um, I think we, we left with more inspiration and uplifted spirits. Uh, when we came in, it was like, everybody's so heavy. But I think there was a process that was involved. Uh, really loved it. Uh, if anything, it has me reimagining um, and resetting the way I think of um, how I am engaging my Taiko um, to everything that's going on right now. Yeah, thank you so much everyone for sharing. Um, we had a really interesting question. Someone asked, um, did North American Taiko influence Taiko in Japan? So I guess the other way over, do you have, um, yeah, that was, and had a second follow-up. So someone else is interested in that question too. <laughs> I'm sorry to take some time <laughs> again, but I have to say that um, there have been groups like Onde Koza and Koro having experienced San Jose Taiko play in our repertoire. Um, they were kind of blown over like, wow, they're having such a good time. They're so happy. <laughs> so I have to say that there was that kind of influence and, and question as well. Yes, I agree. You know, I got to experience Koto here on Maui. They they did come and, you know, it was this, I think it was a two hour concert where it was just, you know, constant taiko and and no emotion, right? And, you know, the, the old sort of, I, I think, um, Japanese art form where you don't show any emotion. And so it was very interesting because after the first taiko conference, um, I think, I believe San Jose performed at that taiko conference and, um, I believe um, Mr. Miyamoto from Miyamoto Unosuke Shoten mentioned that, um, you know, he, he felt, they felt that Taiko in the U US was gonna be really different as compared to what was happening in Japan, because I, you know, they noticed that there were groups that were including perhaps jazz music or, you know, the, the, the music that um, 
they experienced in their compositions. And so they felt that um, the, the Taiko growth in the United States was definitely going to be unique as compared to Japan. And I, you know, I have to say that uh, Koro was influenced by San Jose and, and um, their, their expression and their love was exuding <laughs> in their performances, so. Yeah, I would say that um, there's a definitely, um, not, only, not only from taiko groups outside of Japan, but uh, other types of music. Um, you hear that in a lot of, not the traditional music, uh, which is pretty much the same as it has always been because it's so powerful just as it is. But I'm talking about the newer groups and Kumi Daiko, a lot of the music coming out is influenced by um, Western music. They have improvisation in it sometimes influenced by, by jazz and other, other things. So that's exciting to see. Yeah, I was um, really looking forward to the World Taiko Conference because I thought that's when I would be able to see so many more of the Japanese groups. I mean, we see the main big ones like Koro, you know, but uh, but to be in Japan to see all the more local groups, hopefully, I don't know who was, that's why I was curious, like who would attend this? But I was hoping there would be other groups that I had never seen before and then what kind of influence they had. And I would assume too, as Kenny says, that maybe now, these groups are influenced by more Western music. Because really the cultures are getting closer and closer, actually. Even Japan has become more Westernized. Yeah, um, I want to keep talking to you all forever, but um, we are coming up on the hour. So um, I have a concluding question, but I do want to ask Sojin or Kira, did you have any questions before we head out? <laughs> Just wondering, um, <clears throat> when is uh, Sojin going to start writing the grant so that we can make uh, two? Taiko yeah. goes worldwide. That's right. Let's do the South America leg first. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then with that, then I, I, my question to kind of go out on is like, what is your hope then for the future of Taiko? What do you want to see? I know that we were, we asked this question kind of 15 years ago. It's like, what do you think the future is? But I guess posing that again, what is, do you think the future is, what do you want the future to be of Taiko? I want Taiko to be the, uh, <laughs> what will bring the whole world together. <laughs> it's just that, just that one, even one strike, one solid heartful strike that brings people together. Yeah, I'd like to see, every, it would be nice to see that everybody has a taiko or, or is familiar or knows taiko. You know, they want to either play or they or someone else in their family knows. However, so it spreads out so that it's so familiar with everyone. It would be great. Uh, I always tell a story about uh, when I went to uh, see a performance by Ravi Shankar, um, who's a sitar player. Um, he passed away. Uh, from India and Ala Raka, who also was uh, a, an incredible tabla player. I went to this concert by myself in the in the mid 70s and um, the music was so incredibly beautiful and it just transported us to a, like a whole nother realm. And um, I had this very naive thought that um, if I were to play music, I would, um, my goal should be to um, create music that has that effect on people. And uh, that's something I'm still working on, but I think, I think Taiko definitely has that potential to affect people in that way. Uh, like PJ said, just, just the sound of it um, affecting people to come together. And um, so that's my, my big hope um, because uh, we need that in the world. I think my reflection is that oftentimes when we hear Taiko, there is this connection to a heartbeat, right? You know, many people say that when they hear the sound, it, it reminds them perhaps of their mother's heartbeat or just a heartbeat in general. And to feel that all of our heartbeats are one, you know, we are all equal. And um, 
that I love I love Kenny saying that you never know when you may be performing for someone and that'll be the last time they may have experienced Taiko at that and that you know all of our music should be reflective of that 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 whatever we create can truly affect others and and be something that they would remember. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I am so grateful that you all took the time to join today. Um, there was a quote from the documentary where um, they're talking about being a woman in Taiko and saying it's okay to be up there making this much noise. Um, and so I want to thank you all for being up there and making noise. Um, and just really being such wonderful pioneers in this um, in this musical world. And um, to all the audience, I wanna say thank you so much for joining today. Um, hope you continue to check out uh, the rest of our Janum Digital Film Festival series. Um, you can find them on the YouTube channel here and you can also um, watch the big drum films. Please check those out. They are really incredible. Um, yeah, this like snapshot of that time and we hope crossing our fingers for the sequel. Um, <laughs> thank you so much to all our panelists, um, all the viewers um, and for all your wonderful engaging questions and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Um, and 